like, comment, share, sub subscribe. The time that this video is dropping, this is the most recent Office Admin Pass paper because we're going into the June 2023 exams just around now. In my opinion, this paper wasn't bad, but some of the questions were a little bit different. They were um, taken from smaller parts of the text, so it kind of zoomed in a little bit. But I think it was okay overall. So let's look at the answers that I put, and hopefully you get some ideas. The first question asks you to state two functions which an administrative clerk would be expected to perform in the office. So remember, this is basically just a secretary, is what an administrative clerk would be. So if you use your imagination even, any of the things you could picture a secretary doing would be viable answers. However, using a little bit of the text logic, I went with setting appointments and arranging travel plans. But you could also have said phone calls, giving info to the public, unlike opening and closing times when people call or whatever, managing files, and greeting visitors, which is a little bit of a crossover with the receptionist, but different organizations do operate differently, so I think any of these would have been good answers. And you secured your two first marks there. Section B of that question now asks you to look at these three different sizes of paper and identify two documents that each paper size is used to create. So there's A4, A5, and A6. A4, if you didn't know, is just a regular sheet of paper, regular letter size. A5, as you can see, is a half size of that, and A6 is a small index card type thing. So basically, any normal document um, that wasn't like legal size or whatever, so invoices, reports, quotations, would have been a decent answer for that. Um, but I chose to put letters and minutes, like the minutes of a meeting. A5 could be used for file notes, memos, or any type of shorter thing like that, but you could also have said a telephone message pad or any type of message tape taking paper. And A6 paper, which is practically an index card, can be used for compliment slips. And I couldn't actually think of anything else, but later I saw it could have been petty cash vouchers or invitations. Or probably like the um, cards on files and stuff, so yeah. That's one of those questions. This is one of those questions that might have been useful to fill in a couple of pieces that you did know and then come back to it instead of getting stuck on that so you to get some of the six marks but um you know you don't waste too much time sticking on that if you can't think of things just write them okay so part c of this question asks a to z stationery has advertised a new laptops in the local newspaper i can even zoom in so you can see this However, this didn't result in an increase in purchases by high school students, so suggests three reasons why maybe more students didn't buy laptops, although they were advertised in the newspaper. So I said three reasons why sales may not have increased, or that students may not actually be readers of the local newspaper, and may not have seen the ad, the placement of the advertisement may not have led it to stand out, and the distinguishing features um, of the laptops may not have been advertised sufficiently to draw sales. So it should have been other laptops, but yeah. Things you could also have said were that the ad wasn't visually appealing, or it was too small, there was no contact info, or otherwise there was missing information. Um, you probably could have said things that they were too expensive, or literally, I'm seeing a trend where they seem to want you to use your imagination a bit more in these questions, so whatever you can think of that might result in people who are high school students not buying laptops that were advertised in the paper probably would have been a decent answer, okay? So they continue now to ask you to suggest one incentive that the company could offer customers who purchase laptops. So you buy a laptop, you get a deal, what could they do? I said one incentive they could offer was a year of free technical assistance, support, maintenance, upgrades, etc. Um, but they could also do something like free stationery with a purchase, or a free case for the laptop, or a discount on things like um, mouse, speakers, or webcam, or anything that was going to go with the laptop. And so I think that would have been a decent answer for that. And with that done, you have completed question one and collected your 15 marks up there. Question 2 kicks off asking you to describe the function of the routing slip when processing mail. This is something you didn't 
necessarily... I can see people not knowing this one. So a routing slip is used to record the progress of circulation of a file or document through members of a group who are supposed to view it. So it's kind of like the people who have had this file slash were supposed to have it. After using it, you have your name on the card. You continue to pass it to the different parties who are supposed to have it, if I remember that correctly. Okay, so the second part of question two asks, if the mailroom clerk receives this envelope containing a check for $3,800, what is the procedure that they should be following to handle this mail? So the mail clerk is supposed to open the envelope, make a notation in the remittance book of the quantity and method of cash received. So whether it was like literally cash, in this case, it's specifically a check, so it would say a check, but yeah. Clip the check to a stack for the accounts department. Stamp the letter with received for further processing or filing. So basically, you take out the money, make a note that it was received, hand it over to the cashier or accounts department, whatever they have, depending on the size of the organization. Stamp received, and you pass it on. Okay, so part B was asking three barriers to written communication. So I said three barriers to written communication are vocabulary level differences, bias, just bias, and privacy maintenance challenges. These answers are kind of all over the place, but I didn't know, because there's no really, not really any context on this question, like what kind of barriers they wanted, because technically, a barrier could have been like if the font was too small on a letter and people couldn't read it, or if the language was completely different, it's a letter in French or something, or an email in French. So this was kind of broad, so I also just gave broad answers, and that's the thing. But this is stuff that you could check your textbook for, because these concepts are explored even if they don't have direct answers, you can see where they were going with this. Now part C of this question began asking that we do a little bit more. Um, they say, suppose this company, Premium Foods, has decided to recruit an additional purchasing clerk. They want you to assume that you're a clerk in human resources and prepare an advertisement for the post of purchasing clerk using the following notes. I found that this question was so pre-filled that I wasn't really able to do too much more besides Basically, just copy the notes over, so you see, they requested this info, that the successful applicant should have 5 CSEC passes, that the applicant should have worked in a similar post for 24 months, that they should be submitting the application before April 26th, and I feel like this was the point of the question here, duties of the purchasing clerk to explore, and attributes that they should possess. So, I mean, I went ahead because, you see, on the actual question, no, let me not do that yet. Yeah, it had been pre-filled to this stage, so they were like, position, purchasing clock, qualifications, and then there were just lines here to continue with. So I said, position, purchasing clock, qualifications, five, and I put it in brackets, five, CSEC passes required, including English and office admin, duties, Maintaining a list of suppliers and completing purchase orders. I just picked two things that are done in the purchasing department and I went with it. Attributes, efficient and honest. To be honest with you, almost every department when they ask this question, you can put efficient and honest and it will work out. But you also could have said detail oriented, conscientious, um, aware of like time constraints. Go with managing money, and that would have been fine. Job experience, which they had pre-filled, I put two years. Closing, I said all applications should be addressed to the manager of human resources. Submission typo. Submission deadline is 26th April 2023. It's not supposed to be though. Um, I had questions about how this was spelled too, but you understand what I meant. Right, so that's the format that I would have used. Um, when I've done questions like this in the past, I think I did a, a paper through video sometime in the past, and I had written out a bit more of an ad-sounding ad. 
But, and that's somewhere on the channel, maybe I'll link it. But um, this, they seem to want something simpler, so I did that. Frankly, I didn't feel like I did enough work here to deserve 8 marks, so I was a little suspicious of that. But at the end of the day, um, maybe this was good enough, so. The next question, we begin question 3, asks, The Human Resource Office has scheduled a series of interviews to recruit new employees. So they want you to state three reasons a company would conduct interviews with prospective employees. So I said three reasons why a company would conduct interviews with prospective employees would be to assess the suitability of the worker for the job environment, to ensure that the worker understands the job functions expected of them, and to answer any direct questions that the interviewee may have. And so that seems legit. Um, it could have been other things like meeting the employee, verifying that they are actually the person they said they were, um, giving the, well, this is the direct questions thing, but allowing the worker to ask any questions or to determine the fit, those kinds of things, because after you send in a resume, obviously they just want to meet you and have a discussion about what actually is going on, so that's pretty good. Um, and what I mean to see the character of the person is also an important thing that I could have said. So in this case, they continue, and it's sort of even a leading question to ask you to suggest two desirable behaviors that an applicant should display at an interview. So I said they should display attentiveness and honesty. And I hope those things are spelled correctly. I'm having so many moments of second-guessing myself about that, but you see. Alright, and so the Human Resource Department may store information on applicants in a shared database. State two benefits to an organization of a shared database. So, you see, this doesn't necessarily have to do with human resources exactly, but they clearly want to talk about shared databases. So I said two benefits of a shared database are ease of access to documents among or between departments and improved efficiency since the wait time to request and return documents is eliminated. Basically, anytime they ask for benefits, you could either say they're saving time or they're saving money, and you'd be going in the right direction. So that's a good default answer, but to get more specific, and sure that you actually understand that this is because we're talking about a database, this is the thing here. You can access things without needing to wait, and basically, um, there's not the challenge of wondering, well, not like wondering where a file is, but needing to wait for it to come back from somewhere. So the access is easier, less um, places to go for things, and I guess even things like cross-referencing between departments must be more effective. So accounts would know exactly who they're paying. Human resources knows exactly who sick leave they're taking out, that type of thing. Okay, so section D of this was a little chart thing like this, and they were talking about a number of legal stipulations related to the access and retention of documents. So for each of the following stipulations, I'll outline one example to show how the stipulation might be violated. I think the way this question was asked was a little bit um, maybe confusing, maybe they were doing a lot, but Essentially, it seemed like they wanted you to show an example of a breach of confidence, so... okay. I said a breach of confidence could include disclosing private employee medical records to unauthorized parties, right? The right of access could be violated by allowing junior employees access to restricted company information, just stuff that's above your pay grade or that you're just not supposed to know. They allow you to access that, or on the other side, if you are barred from accessing something that you should be able to see, like your contract, um, that would be a thing, so that's something that actually might even have been a better answer, and, you know, bear that in mind, right? So they say security provisions could be violated, well, I said that, 
if information about a minor is disclosed to an unauthorized party. Security violations is something I wasn't super clear on, but it seems like it was deeply associated with um, stuff that has to do with children and minors and so on. So basically, just things that children shouldn't be exposed to um, in terms of their guardianship and so on. You don't want to disclose the children's information to somebody who's not their legal um, guardian or so. Which appear to be most of what security provisions are about. So, okay. Defamation can occur if serious false negative claims are made about a person or company which would tarnish their public image. So, yeah, basically that. That was them talking about legal stipulations related to the access and retention of documents, so I can see how that fits together. That was for 8 marks, so a lot of marks in the bag. We then move on to section 2, containing the other three questions. Question 4 continues. State two reasons why, after applying for a post, the successful applicant would be provided with a job description. I said that two reasons why a successful um, job applicant would be provided with a job description are to confirm their job functions and to confirm their salary. But you could also have said their job title, their pay grades, um, even who the manager is. Because I guess at its core, this question was about what would you find on a job description. Okay. So part B of this, BI even, asks, The Human Resource Department has realized that there's been an increase in the labor turnover rate in the last six months. Define the term, turnover rate. I said the labor turnover rate is the frequency with which employees leave their jobs at a company. That's basically what that is, people quitting and needing to bring in new people, that's labor turnover. They ask to identify two external factors that might contribute to a high turnover rate in a company. This means two things from outside the company, so not like problems inside the company or anything that were causing people to leave, but things that are attracting people away to the outside. So I said it could be that higher salaries were being offered at competitor companies, or that there were better opportunities for career growth outside the company. Like, you know, if you were working at B-Mobile and Digicel was actually sending people to um, install or do any amount of their functions in a different country that you always wanted to travel to or move to, that might be seen as an opportunity to grow or anything like that. So external factors, right? better training, or just perks in general. Um, or even something like the economy just being different, something that's not necessarily going to a competitor, but just the economic climate is making you think that, hey, I should switch fields even and just do something else. So, um, the workers at a construction company... Wait, no, sorry. Going back to this question for a while, so much of that happens during the entire pandemic and stuff, because people basically found that, hey, I'd rather be doing something else. A lot of people left their jobs, so that happened. Um, the workers at a construction company are paid weekly. Assume that you are the accounts clerk. Use the following info to complete this payroll register with these things. Basically, these types of questions come down to calculate salary, and then calculate deductions, and then do some subtraction. So that's what I did. We looked at the number of overtime hours worked. They work 40 hours normally, so in this case, it was 6, and here it was 10, by my calculations. Hope I'm correct about everything here. So the overtime pay is the rate up here of $8 an hour. So 6 times 8 was 48, 10 times 8 was 80. Their income tax, or PAYE, is 10% of the amount of money they made. So this is their gross pay in this moment, um, which I thought was their basic wage, plus their overtime. So that's how I got that. 
Their tax PAYE was 10%, so I put them in for that there. Their union dues were $5 a week, so they already put that in. So I just took this, subtracted this, subtracted this, and this is what was left. Alright, so that was payroll. And we got... I'm not sure how many marks for that. I missed putting it in, so we'll never know. But um, if you do the math, it'll be the rest to make it 15. Alright, so question 5. I ask you to state three reasons why it's important for an organization to maintain accurate financial records. I said three reasons why it's important for an organization to keep accurate financial records are to correctly remit taxes, to produce accurate financial records, and to be sure not to lose money to poor credit control. Probably there are a number of things you could have said, but I thought taxes always sound important. Just keeping financial records in checks, so you don't have to get like audited or something, would be a thing, and so the investors or what have you, the bank, whatever, stakeholders, know what's going on. And I said lose money to poor credit control. Credit control is basically when you want to be able to extend credits to people who are buying things from you so that they can get the thing now and pay you in a couple of days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days whatever the credit amount of time might be, but if you don't um, keep an eye on that, people can not pay you back, etc. So it's important to, in this case, keep a record of who you gave credit to so that you don't lose money. So that's what I meant by that. State three advantages of using the Impress system to maintain the petty cash. To this day, having done a number of questions like this and read the textbook and everything, I don't really understand when they ask this question what they mean because to me I don't know of any other way to keep petty cash that they talk about besides the Empress system, so okay. So I just went ahead and said three benefits of having petty cash to begin with. Right? So you have improved record keeping because you have the vouchers being traceable, they are a record of where this money went. The reduction of excess checks written for small expenses, which is a basic benefit, and improved efficiency since approval for small purchases can be handled by the manager of the petty cash fund. So instead of needing to get this approved by all of accounting or whoever, the person who's in charge of the amount of money in petty cash can just approve transactions. More petty cash we continue to question in part C. So the petty cash vouchers shown below are outstanding vouchers which must be entered into the petty cash book. So this is what a voucher would look like. Alright, you have the important information here, the number, the dates, the amount that it was for, what it was for. Sometimes they ask you to do things with this down here, but not this time. So we have three of these for different things. The first one was for cleaning materials. The second one was for taxi and bus fare, and the third one was for stamps. So now they ask you to use the cash book on page 17. And they want you to enter whichever information was missing for the three vouchers above, and then restore the impressed for December 1st. Okay. So this is the book, this is what it looked like. I stuck it in here so you could see. You're gonna have to do some back and forth to understand this, but as I always do with petty cash questions, just want people to understand. This is the inside of the book, where money comes in. This is the credit side, where money goes out. And these columns here, well, these, are shared. So basically what happens here is that they receive cash on the first of the month, 150 cash as you see, and then they buy these things here for the month, and those things, like ballpoint pens for example, the total is listed here, and then also under its relevant column, which is stationary in this case. So we have cleaning materials, the total is listed here, and it goes under its special column here. And then you continue doing that for the other transactions throughout the month. 
we come to a total. The total will be the total of this totals column here, but also you individually total these columns. Um, so in this case, stationary, postage, cleaning, and sundries. And when you find the total of all of those, they should match the number that you see here, right? So let me actually just go back and see. Do we understand how we pick that up? Voucher 14 was cleaning materials, total 1840. Cleaning materials, voucher 14, total 1840. Let me zoom in so you can be sure to see that. Is what I put here. The next one was the stream of paper, which was already in. Then on the 12th of November, we had the taxi fare bus fare one, which was voucher 16 for 5250. So really, this was fill in the blank stuff with um, the stuff that was over here. Why did the number I said just now sound different? I don't know, taxi and bus fare for 5250. That's what it was, right? Yeah. Okay, that's what it was. Right, and so voucher 19 was this $20 stamp thing, which is the last one we had to fill in. So yes, you see it was stamps, hill, it was $20, hill, it went onto the stationary column, da 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 da. So we totaled it out, is the point, right? We totaled the totals column, we totaled these individual ones, hill, we wrote those totals down, hill, the L shape was made, well, this and this came to the same number, 108.35. I see the format of this the way they did it. They seem to want you to write this under here, and it's always different every question, but okay. So, the important thing now, restoring the impressed. I took this total of 108, and you see exactly how I came to that. And I found the balance carried down, which they wanted here. It's going to be 41.65. Because we started with the amount of money that we had, which was 150. You remember that? Let me go back up here. 150, we spent 108, so we had 4165 left. So 4165 is the balance that's carried down. And so the important part of how they have this listed here is that you can see the amount of money that we spent plus the amount of money we have left equals the amount of money that we got. And so on this side, what they're expecting to see is on December 1st, excuse me, on December 1st, you have your balance carried down of 4165, and you have your um, cash that you have restored, the same amount that you spent last month is the same amount that you need to get back. So that goes on this inside of the book, and I just put voucher number CB2 following their lead. Where up here they had CB1. I don't even know if that was required, but I just did it. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, I have a video on petty cash if you really need to look into this more, but I hope that that made sense. Okay, so let's go. Question 6 now asks, the customer service clerk of the operations department is one of the first persons to interface with clients. The... Three duties which the customer service clerk should undertake to ensure the customer remains satisfied. This kind of seemed a little bit broad because operations could be a number of things, but I assumed that it might be that we make stuff and people call in to wonder how to get the stuff to work, if it's like a printer or a pressure washer or something, I don't even know. But anyway, I said the things that the clerk could do would be to ask relevant troubleshooting questions to determine the customer's needs, um, to offer information about ongoing promotions, which might have been reaching a little bit, but honestly, that is a customer service thing to do, and to listen carefully and record customer feedback, especially this, so that they can improve the products as a thing. I mean, if it was like, I tried when I was doing this, honestly, to think if it was like KFC is a company, let's just say, and they have customer service in operations or whatever, how is that different from somebody who's making like 
garbage bins if you want to say, and they have an operations department, and it is what it is. So I chose to pick these answers because I thought they were relevant enough. If I had wanted to be extremely textbook, I probably could have gone in there and literally gotten that. But as I say, I see they seem to be wanting you to use your imagination a little bit more than just textbook, so that's that. This is a textbook question now, three functions of the operations office. So I kept it simple. I said quality control testing of manufactured products, work environment safety management, just watching over the factory and what's going on in there to make sure that we're following OSHA, wearing our protective equipment and that kind of stuff, and planning work specs. Um, that's a little bit vague, but like the job costing and so on. Even in the textbook, it's kind of tough to see where operations blends over into just straight up the factory. And I think it's because businesses could be slightly different. But this question of planning work specs, what I mean by that is figuring out how much material and how much labor and stuff we need to complete a job. So they go in a little bit deeper here to talk about this manufacturing company. ChemPro, who manufactures industrial chemicals, and so the operations department has observed that employees are not adhering to safety and operational guidelines in the handbook. So now we need to assume that we are a clock and we need to suggest three procedures that should be followed in each of the following situations, so three each. So the first problem is that staff is discarding empty bottles and cans in the waste paper bins in the office. And remember, we make chemicals, industrial chemicals. So I said heavy duty bins should be installed and staff should begin to place industrial waste material in those bins instead. There should also be signs placed near the bins to direct this. Furthermore, training should be conducted to correct this behavior and direct workers towards proper disposal methods. So I went with bins installed, Science placed and training conducted. Being so weird at writing on this, I don't even know why. But yes, the point is, as I was coming up with these answers, I was trying to do stuff that would be not all like buy equipment, buy equipment, buy equipment, but I kind of varied it. So a piece of this was buy equipment, a piece of this was change what the staff is doing, and a piece was like kind of change the policy. So the next issue was that staff in the general office were affected by fumes coming from the factory and they experienced challenges with their breathing. So I said that staff should be given protective equipment, such as masks and respirators, to protect their health. Ventilator fans can also be installed to redirect fumes away from workers. And it would be a good idea to consider giving workers a fresh air break in between production cycles. That's kind of reaching, but those are three things that would help with literally this issue. Protective equipment, um, change the factory environment, and get the people away from it a little bit more. Here, you know, the factory workers keep slipping and falling was the third issue. So, I went in now to say that the staff should be given non-slip footwear and instructed to wear these at all times. So that's the give them protective equipment. More frequent cleaning procedures uh, should be implemented to reduce the quantity of hazardous fluids on the factory floor. So it's something we can do. And then furthermore, training should be provided about how to manage fluids to keep the walking areas free from excessive slippery material. Right, so again, I solve this with a piece of it is equipment that they're getting. Oops, a piece of it is stuff that we can do at the company itself. And then the last one is the meet in the middle of if we were not getting the floor so slippery in the first place, this wouldn't be a problem. Oh, okay, that was the end of the test. Look at that. Those questions really flew by. So that was the end of the... 2023, January, um, paper two, we dealt with the operations department, petty cash, um, labor turnover and some HR questions, some, um, hiring and recruitment questions uphill, um, a little bit of the mailing room and so on, understanding stationary. 
So really, of all the paper twos I've seen, this one wasn't too bad. I mean, there was something to do, but it felt okay. So I hope this was some help to you. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Sorry about the birds, you'll probably still be able to hear in the background of this in the end. And um, yeah, that's, that's it for now. So there are probably a few more paper twos coming in this season, um, just before at least one I know about. The one that came before this, June 2022, which is an elusive favor, which I only managed to get my hands on yesterday. I'll do that, and you'll see it soon, okay? So until next time, all the best with your studying. Leave any questions down below. Like, comment, share, subscribe, the whole YouTube shtick. Um, and all the best with your exam.